welcome to Cornerstone Baptist Church this Sunday morning. So glad to be in the house of the Lord. Glad to be here to show our Thanksgiving, the beginning of Thanksgiving week. So let me be the first to say happy Thanksgiving to each and every one of you when it comes. And may the Lord continue to bless you. And let's not only wait for this week to show our thanks to God. Let's start out by singing out loud and strong this morning. 59, I will praise him. Let's show our thanks to God as we sing out this morning and open our morning services song. Please stand, 5-9 will be our opening hymn. I will praise him, 59, please stand. When I saw the cleansing fountain Open wide for all my sin I obeyed the Spirit's moving When he said, will thou be clean I will praise him I will praise him Praise the Lamb for sinners slain Verse number two, though the way seemed straight and narrow, all I claimed was swept away. My ambitions, plans, and wishes at my feet in ashes lay. I will can wash away each stain. Then God fire upon the altar, all my heart was set aflame. I shall never cease to praise Him, glory, glory to His name. I will praise Him, I As we sing verse number four, I'll have the instruments drop out when we get to the when we get to the chorus. So let's sing out on verse four, and instruments will drop out. Blessed be the name of Jesus. I'm so glad He took me in. He forgave my transgressions. He has cleansed my heart from sin. Sing it out. I. And the last, verse number five. Glory, glory to the Father. Glory, glory to the Son. Glory, glory to the Spirit. Glory to the Three One. I will praise Him. I will praise Him. Remain standing. You could take your hood off while we talk to God. Second thing is, when we prayed in Sunday school, there were quite a, a bit of there was quite a bit of talking uh, by the young people in the back. When we talk to God, we're not talking. Right. We bow our heads and we close our eyes out of respect for God, and we talk to the one who created this world. Okay, so in a moment, I'm, it's not funny. In a moment, we're going to bow our heads and we're going to talk to the creator. Michael Brown is going to take home any person that I hear talking. You're gone. <laughs> 
is going to take you home because you don't know how to respect God's house. Amen. Okay, and so we're going to close our eyes and bow our heads. And young people, we're going to respect God and we're going to talk to him and we're going to ask for his blessing upon this church service. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Edward, I'm waiting for you to bow your head and close your eyes. Thank you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've created us, that you've sustained us, and that you brought us to church this morning. I pray that we would honor you with the way that we sing, the way that we worship. I pray that we would listen to the word as it's ministered, and that you would work in our hearts. We thank you that you care enough to plead with us through your word. May we respond today. God, I pray that whatever else is going on outside of this building, we leave it there and that we would come before you with open hearts, even wanting to be convicted of sin. Lord, I pray that anyone here today that's lost, that they would be squarely pointed to the Savior and know what they must do to be saved. Help us to sing out today from our hearts and to give you the glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let's continue singing this morning, 78. Thanks to God will be our next hymn, Maroon Hymnals, and a seat back in front of you, 78, as we open up in song, 78. Thanks to God. Thanks to God for my
evening service will be at five o'clock this evening, followed by our men's accountability meeting. And then I would like to meet with ushers right after that men's meeting is over this evening. So ushers, if you could stay back for a few moments. Uh, the retirement home service will be this Tuesday at two o'clock. Uh, of course, our Thanksgiving break will begin this week, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. The kids will be off. No Wednesday Bible study and prayer time at seven because of our Thanksgiving breakfast on Thursday morning. And if you haven't signed up, we don't know that we're supposed to have food for you and we want to have food for you. And so it's open to the entire congregation. Just, I would ask that before you leave today, if you would sign up, the sign up sheet is um, going towards the annex area down by the ramp. There's a sign up sheet posted to the wall. If you would be so kind as to put your name on there so that we can make sure that we have enough food for all who would like to be here for the Thanksgiving breakfast. Uh, food will be served from eight to nine, eight to nine, so one hour. If you miss that hour, you, you won't get a chance to sit down and eat. Right after the eating time, we will have the testimony service beginning from nine until 10 o'clock. And we do this early, so no one has an excuse to use food as a reason why they can't be here or family or whatever. Early in the morning, and we're done by 10 o'clock, we will be finished at 10 o'clock, and you can get back to your family and whatever else. But let's take Thanksgiving Day as an opportunity to give God the glory. So this coming Thursday, eating at 8 to 9. Saturday, men's and women's prayer meeting at 9 o'clock, bus and soul winning meeting at 9.30. We have 10,000 doors to complete before the end of this year, and we're a little past half. And so we really need our soul winners to come out, knock on some extra doors. I know I'll be getting out during the week to knock on extra doors so that we can get our goal. Let's do what we can and make sure that we leave a, a good quality gospel tract and uh, a good taste in people's mouths about the work of the Lord here and their need for Jesus Christ. Uh, there will be uh, a, a Bells. Uh, the girls worked hard and they uh, raised money for Bells. Uh, there will be a practice today at 1.30. I believe that's the time, is that right? 1.30 today. The church Bells are for the girls' choir uh, that worked for it, okay? So it's specifically for the girls' choir. That's what those bells are for. Uh, of course, we're coming up on Christmas. The Christmas uh, time comes. And we, we always, as a church, want to uh, celebrate and remember the birth of Jesus Christ. And um, if you're like me as a believer, you're always looking for ways to um, make sure to keep the real meaning at the forefront and not get swept away with commercialism. Uh, and so really wanting to do that as a church body. And so we have several things uh, designed to help us with that. Number one is our Christmas offering. Christmas is a time to give. We want to give to God. And this year, our Christmas offering goal is $4,500. And there are things needed here um, at our church. We'd like to, again, we've mentioned this in the past, but we'd like to put up some more security cameras on our property, help keep God's people safe keep people safe as they worship. There are some needs in the sound booth, some different things. Um, we think we might have a, a, a speaker that needs to be replaced, <coughs> things of that nature. Uh, $4,500 is the goal. Every year since this church has began, I have given an offering to the Lord, something apart from my tithes and offerings designated as a Christmas offering to the Lord. And I wanna encourage you to pray, seek God's face, and give a Christmas offering this year. December 3rd, which is coming up very quickly, will be our Christmas potluck Sunday. And uh, we enjoy food, we enjoy fellowship. We will eat good on December 3rd. Um, after the morning service, we will have that potluck speaking for us all day, Sunday school morning service and afternoon service is Pastor Phil Clark. He has not preached here before, but he uh, pastors the church in California that 
Portia came from. And uh, so uh, her former pastor, he ran the, the church bus that she rode and came to Christ through. And so Pastor Clark uh, will be preaching to, uh, that day on December the 3rd. I want you to come out and bring visitors. Uh, we'll have a potluck again after the service and then an afternoon service and then we'll be done for the day. That's December 3rd. We not only need you to come out, but we need you to bring food. We need everyone to bring food. Um, we got real close last, uh, what, what, what meal was that? Anniversary, was that anniversary? Sunday? Stewardship. We got real close to running out of food. Uh, we don't want that problem. Ladies, men, let's make sure we bring food out for the Christmas potluck. The Christmas push for the bus kids will run December 3rd through the 24th. Their captains will be talking to them about that, but they'll be earning Christmas bags, boxes, stockings, whatever they're called. Um, as they come to church each Sunday in December, they'll be able to take those home on Christmas Eve, December the 24th. We'll have uh, a program for the children, one service in the morning at 11 o'clock, and then we'll be done for the day on Christmas Eve. Eve, December the 24th. Um, be a half day of school, December the 14th, and then the Christmas break will begin. We want to keep good order in our services. That's why I talked to the young people as we were praying. Good order means we're not talking uh, when someone is talking from this platform. Um, it means in a moment that we're going to take up the offering. Uh, we should not have people talking while we're taking up the offering. We want to have good order um, in our services. And so we ask a few things. Number one, please don't linger in the hallways or overflow during the preaching services. When the preaching of God's word is happening, you ought to be here uh, to listen to God's word as it's being preached. It's important that you be where you can hear and see God's man as he's preaching God's word, no matter who that man up here is. And so we ask for that. We also ask that there not be any eating in this auditorium. And so candy, uh, lollipops, uh, whatever, chips, cookies, um, we're here for a different reason. This isn't a kitchen. This isn't a cafeteria. This is where we meet to hear God's word preached to us. No eating in the auditorium. Kids running in the halls. We should not have young people running in the hallways. Um, it's disrespectful to our meeting. It's disrespectful to God's house. And so adults, um, if you see children running in the hallways, don't just let that go. Don't let that go. I, I need your help, adults, to keep this uh, worship-focused environment. Uh, we want to worship God and we want to hear from him and we don't want anything to take away from that. So, like I said, no eating in the auditorium. Is that a sucker in your mouth? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's just the stick. Okay, if you could just take that out of your mouth, then I won't think you have a sucker in your mouth. But no, no eating in the auditorium, no running in the hallways. Parents, control your children in the church. Make sure they're not making messes. And you can control your children in church. Okay, I got a, a two-year-old sitting right there, and she's not being perfectly good and still, but she's being still and quiet and sitting in her seat. And uh, you can control your children in church. And parents, you make sure you discipline and train your children in such a way that they know how to act, not only at home, but in God's house. Okay, so please help with that. We should not have people getting up and walking around during the church service, just Okay, there are ushers and other people that need to walk around and that type of thing, but we should not. This isn't just a place where we can just get up and roam freely. It's a church service, and we ask that you respect it in that way. Um, also, uh, there should not be talking during prayer time. That is wrong. And that shows really that you need more instruction on how to act in church. Uh, when we're talking to God, your mouth should be closed, and you should be listening to that prayer. Discipline your mind to listen to prayer so that you can offer that prayer before the Lord and he can bless our church. And we certainly need that in this day and age. We need a church that God can bless. And so we should not be talking during prayer. We should not be talking while the preacher's preaching. 
there should be no walking around during the preaching of the Bible. When it's time to preach, we should not have people getting up and walking out, walking back in and out. That's a distraction. Um, if you have a little one and they're uh, getting antsy and you need to take them out, that's fine. Bring them back in, sit in the back. But not just, hey, I, I need to get up. Right. No, okay, if you have to go to the restroom, we'll have a handshaking time in just a moment. You can run the restroom, run back, but not just, oh, he's preaching, I think I'll just get up and go somewhere. No, no, let's not do that. And we should pay attention in church. We should really seek to hear from the Lord. In this world that we live in, we need to hear from God. And so one way we make sure we pay attention is turning off our cell phones and so that they're not a distraction. And so if you have a cell phone, going to ask also that you'll power that off at this time. Double check to make sure that it's powered off. Uh, we worship the Lord with some special music. Uh, not like the typical entertainment style church at all. We don't clap for the, the special music. Uh, we say amen, which means I agree. The word amen means I agree. And if you're worshiping and you agree with what's being said or sung, then an appropriate way to apply to that, to reply to that, is to say amen, which means I agree. And uh, we, we like that word here. Parents, I'm going to ask that you get your children uh, that are in the nursery after the service. Don't let them linger in there because the nursery workers have things to do as well. And so once church service is over, if you have uh, a nursery age child, please go and get them. As the ushers make their way forward, thank you for praying while we were in Nepal. Uh, the Lord did bless our journey. And it is 11 o'clock at night for me right now. So I need your prayers all day as I preach because there's a lot of cotton in here right now going on. Uh, but we praise the Lord for what he was able to accomplish on our missions trip. And I thank you all for praying. Michael Brown, if you would come and ask the Lord's blessing as we pray. And when he's praying, nobody's talking. When he's done praying and the piano is playing, nobody's talking. And uh, we respect God's house. Amen. 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 Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and let's pray to God. Dearly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for, for today. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the, the weather, Lord, that you've given us, God, that we could come out and, and worship, Lord, and comfortably, Lord, I Thank you, Lord, for this building, God, that we're able to come to worship you in. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you will be with this offering right now, Lord, that you will bless it, Lord. I pray that you will bless those that give, Lord, and Lord, I just pray that you will continue to sustain the church, Lord, as you have throughout the years, God, and Lord, I just pray, Lord, that your will be done. I pray that you be with the message, Lord, that you have prepared for us, God, and Lord, be with Pastor Lewis as he speak, Lord, even though you may have be a little jet lag or whatnot. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you give him power. I pray, Lord, that you be with him as he's up here giving the word. I pray that you be with the congregation, Lord, that people will be hearing, Lord, and, and paying attention, God. I, I pray for the, the kids, Lord, that may have uh, maybe a short attention span, God, that you will help them to pay attention today or help them to be not a distraction, God. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you they be blessed for it. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. No.
Let's continue worship by standing with me as we turn to 21, 2, 1. Christ is our cornerstone as we sing our final song this morning. Let's sing on up. If he is your cornerstone this morning, if he's the reason why you are here, 21 should be your hymn. Christ is our cornerstone. We want everyone up and on their feet praising the Lord this morning with us. 21.
turn to Hosea chapter 2. Hosea chapter 2. Hosea chapter 2, should not be talking, Hosea chapter 2. title of the message is God's Relentless Love, The Results of Idolatry. The Results of Idolatry. We want to have good understanding of the background of this book of the Bible. Preaching through the book of Hosea, when Hosea prophesied, Israel was at the peak of its power, the peak of its prosperity. Israel had a lot of silver. Israel had a lot of gold. They were fat in that way. A lot of abundance. When Hosea was written, some 750 years before Jesus, the army of Israel was mighty. It was a great time of prosperity. The cities, I'm up here. The cities were strongly fortified. Israel during this time was filled with splendid palaces. Houses were adorned with silver. Houses were adorned with gold, rare wood, expensive stones. Israel was living in an abundant time in her history. The theme of the book is God's love for Israel, his love for his own chosen people, and him calling Israel to repent and promising and foretelling judgment if Israel would not repent. And almost in every chapter, showing the future restoration of Israel, God's people, partially fulfilled with Israel being in the land today. And it'll be even more fulfilled when Israel turns to her Messiah, Jesus Christ. If you look at chapter 2, there are 23 verses in that chapter. And this morning we covered verses 1 through 5. In the morning service and the evening service, we'll cover the rest of the verses. And we will end tonight with verse number 23. So we're in Hosea chapter 2. If you could keep something there, your hand or a piece of paper, a pen or ribbon or anything, keep it in Hosea 2 because we're going to anchor there for the message and go with me to Hosea chapter 14. So Hosea chapter 2, but we're going to look first at Hosea chapter 14. We cannot get away with having another God. We just can't get away with it. God doesn't let his people commit idolatry and go unrebuked and unchastened. It does matter how you live. And we live in a day where people say, well, I'm, I may not be really living for God and putting him first and and seeking his face, but it's all right. Uh, It'll be okay, and and God knows my heart. I've heard that so many times. People will live in a way that is completely contrary to God's word, and they'll pull out that card, God knows my heart. Well, listen to me. You've been lied to. Yes, God knows your heart, 
but it does matter how we live. If you fall under God's judgment, you won't be happy. You won't be happy. And when he deals, he's thorough. The wheels of God's judgment grind slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. And if you're his, you won't be happy in sin. If you're not his, you've got an even bigger problem. And you're in danger of hellfire. So Hosea chapter 14, verse number 1 is the cornerstone verse of the book, I believe. Hosea chapter 14, verse number 1. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. If you'll go back now with me to Hosea chapter 2, Hosea chapter 2, all day long, morning and evening service, I want you to see the I wills in these verses. Either I will or will I, spoken of by God. But Hosea chapter 2, beginning in verse number 6. Everyone looking at the scripture, following along, paying attention to God's word, that's what we should have. Good order in the service. Hosea chapter 2, verse number 6. God is speaking here to his people. He says in verse number 6, Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then was it better with me than now. For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold which they prepared for Baal. Baal is a false god. It'd be like us saying the devil today. God gave them oil and wine and, 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 and corn and they used it for the devil. Verse number nine, therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof and my wine in the season thereof and will recover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. And now will I discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers and none shall deliver her out of mine hand. I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons and her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereof she said, these are my rewards that my lovers have given me. And I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. And I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them, and she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers and forgot me, saith the Lord. Two simple points this morning. Judgment delivered and joy departed. Judgment delivered and joy departed. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we could be in your house today and that we can sing songs that glorify your name and speak of you and how we can now open the Bible and plainly preach from it. Lord, I pray for your strength and power and understanding and the leadership of the Holy Spirit to preach today. And that good work that you have already designed to accomplish in our lives through the preach word, I pray that you would. And I pray that we would know it and recognize 
as you speak to us. Bless this time and, and hallow it as unto you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Judgment delivered. I want you to look again with me at verse number six in your Bible. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. Israel is being pleaded with. Israel's not listening. Israel's being punished. Israel still isn't listening. We're talking about 750 years before Christ. God says, I'm going to hedge up your way with thorns, Israel. Why? Because Israel had an evil way. And God says, I'm going to put a stop to it somehow. I'm going to put thorns in your way. Have you ever stepped on something really, really sharp? Can you imagine stepping on a pile of thorns? God is saying here, I will deliver judgment. Now, if you've ever stepped on something sharp, you didn't die from it, but it hurt. Man, you felt it. Uh, just a few weeks ago, that happened to me. I was in the kitchen, I think, getting a cup of coffee, and all of a sudden I stepped on, the, on the, the carpet there, right in the dining room. Ah, what is that? And I pulled something out of my foot. It, it, it didn't kill me, but it hurt. God says to Israel, I'm not going to extinguish you, but it's going to sting because you won't listen. God knows how to make us smart. He knows how to give us a divine spanking. He says, I'm going to hedge up the way with thorns. God says, I'm going to make a wall that you, you won't be able to find your paths. Do you see that in verse number six? In other words, you're not going to go anywhere. You've gotten away from me, and because of that, I'm not going to let you go anywhere. We, we have a way of when we get away from God, we say, I'm going to go my own way. God's saying in that verse, I'm not going to let you even do that. Uh, you, there'll be no real progress in your life. Because you've turned away from me. And you've turned away from me and you've determined to go that way, but I'm going to put a wall there. And you say, well, I can't go back to God because I don't want to. I'm going to go this way. God says, I'll put a wall there. I'll hedge up your way with a wall and with thorns and nothing's going to work out because you've turned away from me. God knows how to make it so that there's only one direction to go back to. And that's back to him. That's the teaching of verse number six. And no real progress. God's saying, I'm going to stop your way. I made one mistake when I was in Nepal. I wanted to go for a walk. And I got up real early in the morning. And I headed out of the hotel out on the streets of Kathmandu at about 530 in the morning. Wrong idea. Uh, you're in a third world country. Nobody looks like you. It's dark. The sun hasn't come up yet. And everybody's staring at you. People are out on the street at 530 in the morning and they're looking at you in the dark. And you're walking down a street and it's creepy as creepy can be. And but there's street lights. The street lights are on and you're walking down the street. And people, have their, their, you know, people are waking up, so they have some of their lights on inside of their apartments. And you're walking down the street, and all of a sudden you hear this sound, and all of the lights on that block turned off. Now, I'll just be honest with you. I was scared to death because now I could see nothing. I'm in a third world country. I couldn't see behind me. I couldn't see in front of me. I was hedged in. God says in verse number six, I know how to hedge my people in so that they can't go anywhere until they turn back to me. He will put a wall in your way. And whenever you feel like God might be putting a wall in your way, you need to ask God, what is it there for? Like Israel, is there an idol in my life to where you had to put this wall up and hedge my way in? If you feel this way, look for the idol until it's found. You'll find no satisfaction in your idols. I must say that. People run to things in place of God hoping to find satisfaction and they never do. 
A believer, a believer, someone that's born again, somebody that's saved, is not going to find satisfaction in a bottle. You're not going to find satisfaction in booze. You're not going to find satisfaction in marijuana. You know, these Hollywood movies that just take God's name in vain and, and throw around uh, uh, the, the, the foul, wicked language of this world and, and all of the inappropriate uh, 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 sex scenes and all of that, you fill up on that and you think somehow that's going to satisfy you. It will not. The music of this world that emphasizes the things of the flesh and not the things of God, you can turn it on and pipe it all the way up but it's not going to satisfy your soul. Listen, it might appeal to your flesh a little bit, but it won't satisfy your soul. Hear me. Hear me. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. He's the only one that can cleanse and make you whole. He'll give you peace you never knew. Real love and joy he'll give to you. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. When God's people turn away from him, he puts thorns and walls in your way. And what he's saying is, get back to me. Get back to me. Verse number seven, and she shall follow after her lovers, but shall not overtake them. This is God's people wandering in the wilderness. Now listen to me, they were not literally wandering in the wilderness for they were in Israel, but spiritually they were wandering in the wilderness. Spiritually, you can be wandering in the wilderness. What's happening in my life? Where am I going? And the Bible is saying here that you, uh, you can't catch up to your idols. The Bible says in verse 7, she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. So Israel's running after the idol, and the idol keeps moving. And, and the idol's moving. It, it's like, you know, uh, uh, you, you've, you've got something, uh, uh, maybe a, a fishing pole out in front of you, and, 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 and you're moving, and, and, and attached to the hook is maybe a piece of candy or something and you're moving and the kids trying to grab after it and, and you're moving and they can't get it because it's moving. God says you're running after something that's moving and you'll not overtake it. You'll spend your life just spinning your wheels, chasing after nothing. Never can a man catch up to his idols. You can commit fornication as much as you want, but, but listen to me, you'll never catch up to your idol. It will never satisfy. You can be wrong in your finances and say, I'm going to lie, cheat, and steal and get my way through. You'll just keep on chasing that idol until the day that you die. You'll never catch it. You'll never catch it. It does matter how you live. Now, now please understand, your finances show your Christian character. There's lots of other things that show your Christian character, but finances show your Christian character. You lie, cheat, steal, and, and listen, here's a sin. A sin. Borrow and don't pay back. You're showing your Christian character. Get yourself in the debt and, and lie and steal, and some people even kill. And commit suicide? That's an idol. Not handling your finances right is an idol because so many people live that way today, but it's not the way a believer should live. A believer should, watch me now, this way, this way, be content with what they have. And listen, that doesn't mean that you can't work harder to get more, but you work for it. It doesn't mean you can't work harder to get more, but listen to me, those of you that like to work harder to get more, it means you're content with what you already have. Finances show what you really are. And we have had members over the years that have been terrible testimonies in the area of their finances. Terrible testimonies because they borrow and don't pay back. That's not Christian. 
and having sorry finances and, and thereby sorry Christian character becomes an idol all of its own. Verse 7, and she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Man, she gets frustrated and discontent. This is the, 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 the wife, which is Israel, the harlot, which is Gomer. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband. Amen. For then was it better with me than now. Listen, the, 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 the harlot is saying here, I am getting nowhere in my idolatry. I think I'll wake up and go back to my first husband. Who is that? That is God. And I am convinced there are people in this room right now, right now, hearing my voice. You know you need to get back to your first husband. Because it was better with you then than it is now. Thanksgiving falls right where we are as we're preaching. You know I didn't plan that. I didn't plan this. There's no way I planned this. But look at verse number 8. For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold which they prepared for Baal. They didn't realize that their blessings came from God. But they did. The, the goods that they had, the food, the wealth, it came from God. And the Bible says they used it on the devil's business. They prepared it for Baal. These were blessings of God before when they were following their first husband. He gave them corn. What is corn? It's food. It speaks of sustenance, that which we need. Remember when God gave you corn, I'm talking about food for your soul. I'm talking about the Bible was preached and you were excited about it. And it was, what can I get out of this? You really read your Bible. Now listen to me, I'm not talking about just opening the book and reading words. How often do we read our Bibles, but we really don't read our Bibles? I'm talking about an attitude and a mindset that we bring to the Word of God when we open it. We should open it before the Lord. And a good practice before you read the Bible is to ask God to bless as you read. Before you read it, God, open your words up to me. Don't, don't just flippantly read the Bible. Listen to me. If we're not reading the Bible thoughtfully, then we're just wasting time. And really, you could do the, the same act of just taking the Bible and turning it upside down, and you do that for an hour, you got the same thing out of it that you're getting now. Because you're not really reading it. But when you slow down and really read the Bible, there's treasures. There's treasures. We see this in Sunday school. We've read those, those miracles how many times in our Christian experience, but when you slow down, you should be doing that every day. Really read the Bible. And let me say this, shame on you if you don't read the Bible. Get a copy of God's Word if you don't have it. Get God's Word. Read His Word. Ask Him to speak to your heart. He wants to plead with you. He wants to give you corn. Remember when He gave you corn? He says, I gave you wine. This speaks of refreshment. Wine. That, 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 how about the new wine which pictures the blood of Jesus Christ that can refresh a lost soul? The blood of Jesus Christ is the only thing that can wash away your sins. Precious blood. Oil. I gave you oil that is emblematic of the Holy Spirit. He says, I gave you silver and gold. You had good finances when you were with your first husband. I took care of you. Verse number nine. It was Thanksgiving, but verse number nine came. Therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof and my wine in the season thereof and will recover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. God says, that which I have given to Israel, I can take away 
from Israel. God says to his people today, that which I have given to my people, I can take away from my people. We do this with our children. We say, I'll give you this privilege, but if you mess up, I'm gonna take that privilege away. And several times I have had to say, okay, it's your birthday, no birthday gift today. Because I wanna teach my children character, not just give them stuff and Oh, it's Christmas, but you have, you have this whole train wreck of a year, and you expect now that it's December 25th that, that everything's going to work out for you. No, 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 no. Taking it away. God says, you treat me like that all year long. You treat me like that. You just do me like that. And God says, that which I've given, I can take it away. God takes his goodies away from those who don't appreciate them. We better love and appreciate the good hand of our Lord upon us. And we better sit down and thank him. That's what Thanksgiving is about. You think it's about a turkey, you've been brainwashed. Okay, nothing wrong with having turkey. I love turkey, but Thanksgiving is about you sitting there and, and really thinking about your blessings and, and, and letting it well up in your heart to the point where you just praise God. We give privileges to our children, and sometimes we have to take them away. Some of you kids don't understand the disruption that's brought to your home when you're disobedient. God says, I know how to deal with my disobedient children. He says also in verse number 9, I'll take away the flax that was used to cover their nakedness. Israel was spiritually naked you must realize that you're spiritually naked when you're not right with the Lord. We see this at the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. Turn there with me. Keep your place in Hosea 2. Revelation chapter 3. Christ is speaking to one of his churches. It's a lukewarm church. They're a church, but barely. They're a church, but they're worldly and lukewarm and he calls them his own people naked spiritually revelation chapter 3 verse number 17 revelation 3 17 because thou sayest i am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked listen if you're here and you are not saved Christ must become your covering because the fig leaves of your good works can never cover your sin you need a coat of righteousness which is only provided by the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins and will take that nakedness and cover it with his own righteousness go back to Hosea chapter 2 and look at verse number 10. We looked at this concept in Sunday school that God knows how to uncover the sin of his people and reveal it before all. Look at Hosea chapter 2, verse number 10, where the Bible says, And now will I discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and none shall deliver her out of mine hand, God will uncover it. He will uncover it. And notice how the Bible even seems to teach us that your idols will reject you. None shall deliver her out of my hand. Man, you're running to your lovers, your idols. But they can't save you from God's judgment. And the idols cannot deliver because judgment has been delivered. When judgment is delivered in our lives, number two takes place. Our joy is departed. There is no real joy for God's people when they are in sin. Did you hear that? You can cover it with shopping. You can cover it with entertainment. You can cover it with going over to this person's house and running here and running there. Running here and running there. That's what people will do over the holidays to try to mask their real problem, which is a spiritual need. There's no 
real joy for God's people when they are in sin. Look at verse 11. And I will cause all her mirth to cease. What's mirth? That is happiness and joy. God says, I'll shut it down. Her feast days, what's that? Holidays, like Thanksgiving. Her new moons and her Sabbaths and all her solemn feasts. This is talking about the Jewish feasts. We can apply it to Thanksgiving. Listen, when, when, when you're in sin, it doesn't matter what the calendar says. There's no joy. In fact, what I have seen is that there is more heartache and unhappiness during the holidays when people aren't right with God than any other time of the year. Why? Why? Because people know at those times of the year they're supposed to be happy, but they're not. And that's when suicide is spiked up and drunkenness is spiked up during the holidays. There's no real joy for God's people when they're in sin. The God of prosperity will never let you prosper in the real ways. You say, what do you mean the real ways? Man, a, a godly marriage, raising children that know and love the Lord, serving in God's ministry and seeing him work in lives. <laughs> Listen to me, the God of prosperity will never let you prosper in the real ways. So why don't you reject the God of prosperity and go back to your first husband, for then it was better with you than it is now. The same God of heaven that allows riches can take them away. God says, I'll just take it away. You won't even enjoy it. Even if you have it, you won't enjoy it. Look at verse number 12. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereof she had said, these are my rewards that my lovers have given me. What's that? The price of a prostitute. These are my rewards which my lovers have given me. And I will make them, God says, I will make them a forest. And the beasts of the field shall eat them. God says your stuff is like the price of a prostitute. The rewards of idolatry. The rewards of idolatry. People win the lottery. Man, I'm going to play that lottery Okay, even if you want it, it's the reward of idolatry. God's not going to bless it. Follow the lives of people that win these huge jackpots. They, they end up uh, suicide. They end up in court. They end up divorced. They end up strung out. Your problems aren't going to be taken away because you buy a lottery ticket. The rewards of your idolatry aren't going to get you ahead. Verse 13. And I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them. And she decked herself with what? Her earrings and her jewels. And she went after her lovers and forgot me, saith the Lord. Don't let physical extravagance rule your heart. Living for the things, the things, the, the entrapments of this world, and all the time forgetting God. Those words scare me and forgot me. Those words scare me. I'm sorry this morning. Those words haunt me. Those are no light words in the English Bible to me that God's people, it could be said of them that they forgot me. I don't want to forget him. You say, why? Because when I was lost and undone and, and really spiritually in skid row, when I was in the projects of Chicago being raised by a single mom with a dad that wanted nothing to do with me, God remembered me. He remembered me. And I don't want to forget him in any way of my life. And I don't want to see you forget him. God's people forgot him. Why? Stuff. They had stuffitis. They wanted extravagance in this. They were more concerned about their earrings than their Bibles. They were, listen, today, if it were today, this, this is the God of many people right here. I'm holding it up. Because when you get up in the morning, this is what you're looking for. Uh, when, when you go to bed at night, this is what's on your mind. And, and this right here takes a back seat to this. And the God of heaven says, they've forgotten me. 
they've forgotten me. How about the time that comes when God says, I'll forget you? He forgets those eternally that don't come to Jesus Christ for salvation. I'm so thankful that on April 22nd, 1993, as a 13-year-old boy, I came to Jesus Christ and he saved my soul. Stop telling yourself that you're going to live forever. A lie of the devil. Stop telling yourself that you are immortal. Look this way. I'm talking. Stop telling yourself that you're going to live forever. You know what's going to happen if Jesus Christ doesn't come back first? You're going to die. But where will your soul be? The Bible says it'll be in heaven or hell. Quit acting like you're never going to have a casket. If I have to die, Pastor Lewis, it's going to be a long time from now. So somebody that's 40 says, I probably have till I'm 60 or 65. Somebody that's 60 or 65 says, I probably have till I'm 80 or 85. Listen to me. If man can't kill death, he tries to put it off and stall it. But have you ever wondered why God lets us go to so many funerals while we're still alive? I think it could be God's way of reminding us that we're going to die. God keeps sending us to funerals and cemeteries to say one day that's going to be you. And if you check out without Jesus as your Savior, you're going to die and burn in hell, the Bible says. Come to him. Don't forget God. He is pleading. If you're not saved, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Christian, you are saved. Pat, no, put that away. Thank you. Look this way. Christian, you know the Lord. You know the Lord. He's pleading with you to get right in those areas. You say, what areas? You already know if I don't. He's pleading with you to get right in those areas. And he's saying, if you won't, I'll punish you. And then we say, well, I'll just play a little bit longer. And then he says, I'm done. There comes a time when God says, I'm done. And he uncovers the nakedness of his people for all to see. And it's happened in this church several times throughout the, the short 15-year history of this church when God says, okay, you, you played long enough. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take off the clothes and strip you naked. I'm going to show the whole church and the world what you really are. He says, don't forget me. And that first verse we looked at in Hosea, O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. The results of idolatry are too terrible to endure. Run to God. Run to God, not things. Thanksgiving's coming. Praise the Lord for it. Don't let things, food, people be your God. Return to the Lord in whatever area he chose you to return in. It could be the Bible. For some of you, I'm convinced it's the Bible. Even some of you that read the Bible, you aren't really reading the Bible. You don't take the mindset to the Bible like you should, because if you did, you'd get more out of it and you'd live different. It'd be seen that you, live, you read the Bible. It would be seen. It's the Bible, reading the Bible. Whatever it is, return. He deals return. He's pleading return. Return, return, return. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll show us the areas that we need to return in. And that as you plead with us, will respond to you and Lord I pray that as an unfaithful wife in whatever area you show us that we'll really say in our heart that we're going to return back to our first husband knowing that it was so much better then work in hearts Lord Father you, you know that and uh, it's been a lot of traveling and it's 
about midnight in my head right now, but God, I pray that something that was said would touch hearts and that there'd be some good decisions in the invitation. And not only that, but, but if someone here today is unsaved, that what was said about salvation, what was said about the blood of Christ, what was said about being thirsty spiritually, what was said about death, how we can't escape it, would lead them to really ask, what do I need to do to be saved? And that before they leave this building today, they'll call upon the name of the Lord. Bless the invitation. I pray that there be a real inspection of hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with your heads bowed, eyes closed.